On this week's episode of the Investors Corner, we are joined by Paul Hutchinson of Hutchinson and Legal Associates. And we'll be talking about how to set up a trust and why every landlord should consider having one. We'll talk about the benefits of a trust, tax implications of having one in place, and trust compared to other estate planning tools too. Now we've had to split this up into two episodes because there is so much information packed into this episode and so many insights that you should know as a landlord to protect your family's future further on down the line. So make sure that you're listening to this one. Like I said, it's in two parts. Second part is coming up. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button. Don't miss any episodes on the Investors Corner podcast. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Thanks for all that information, Paul. I mean, yeah, that's probably the reason why you speak to experts, because 99.9% of that I didn't know. So yeah, it's good uh, providing that information because I'm sure other people didn't know as 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 well and that's what the experts there are I can't there wait for. for the first person to ring you up and say I've written a trust on chat GTP yeah will it stand up I've got AI to write <laughs> well, it for well, me. do you know what I will tell you a story about that and this is a god although it's already happened this, okay, it, yeah. no it's not it's not already <laughs> happened but what it had what to, what happened was um we had a client uh who, she became a client she was a or is a GP in the Gloucestershire area um and my comeback to what she was about to tell me, what she told me, which I'm about to tell you, was if I Googled my symptoms and ran it through ChatGPT, what would you do? And she said, I'd raise my eyebrow and tell you you were stupid. And I said, right. <laughs> Is that go. permission yeah, for me yeah. to do the same? <laughs> so we'd sent her, or she'd been sent a draft trust. So she ran it through ChatGPT. And the trust deed has the word settlement in it. Um, and ChatGPT had translated that as township. Okay. So right. it's talking about her, her discretionary township. Um, <laughs> and she became a little bit confused. Yeah. So we're not, not quite, quite there yet. yet. So we're not, <laughs> we're not quite there yet. I did um, see a picture of uh, someone, someone had asked Chat to do a picture of salmon swimming upstream, and it was literally salmon fillets. In oh. the water, which which nice. Well, I'll show I'll show you off camera. I was playing with ChatGPT's artificial photograph generator, mm. yeah. and it was doing really well until I asked it to do a cat doing tree pose and yoga, and it was a cat holding onto a tree. Yeah. Um. So it hasn't <laughs> quite quite got got there yet. Still a bit of work bit to literal. do. So I think at forty seven years of age, my job as a trust lawyer <laughs> and tax advisor is safe. safe. Yeah. yeah. Until <laughs> retirement. Yeah. Hopefully. Absolutely. Um. Paul, talk to me about the responsibilities of a trustee because I think this is important to touch on because I suppose it's got to be a certain type of character um, that that knows how to deal with a trust and you need to trust them in mm-hmm. order to do things to do things right. So yeah, if you could break down the responsibilities, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, and and, and you've stolen my line. <laughs> um, when people say to me, who should I appoint as trustees? I say, well, the key to the word trustee is trust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and not in the sense of the trust deed, it's to trust them. Mm. Because, yes, you can be a trustee of your own trust. And normally, uh, the person who sets the trust up has the power, whilst they have mental capacity, to appoint and remove trustees and appoint and remove beneficiaries. So I used to describe them as, as um, back in the day, so like of the Len Goodman of the of the trust world, you know, they, they, they have the casting vote. Mm. Because trustees' decisions in basic Trust Law 101 that comes from the, the Trustee Act of 25 is that trustees' decisions must be unanimous. But if the settler, who is the trustee, has the ability to remove trustees, they retain a degree of control. Yeah. But picking up on what you said, absolutely it should be someone that they trust because you don't want to go through the legal hassle Mm -hmm. of removing a trustee. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on the type of trust, the ongoing responsibilities can be relatively simple. Um, Something that's new and something that really does scare me how many people aren't aware of it is what they call the TRS, the Trust Registration Service. This was introduced in 2018 by anti-money laundering rules. But as with always with HMRC, their systems weren't ready 
for a number of years. And then what they then did was they gave everyone nine months to register trusts with them. So this is all historic trusts. For the purposes of this discussion, all trusts. So will trusts that have been activated, lifetime trusts. So there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of trusts had to be registered by September 2022. And it's you have to create a new online government gateway portal so you can't use the same one that you use for your personal tax returns and you have to go through and register the trust and you can be fined if you haven't done it now there are um, what they call trust registration agents such as ourselves who can actually register multiple trusts on behalf of clients uh, and i've seen the fees range from 100 pound a trust to 800 pounds a trust Mm. Um, but the biggest thing I would say is if people have got trusts, whether that they've set up in their lifetime or will trusts that their their loved one, uh, their mum, their aunt who died have now been activated because of death, make sure they've been registered because of the fines. And this is nothing to do with tax. This is all about, like I said, anti-money laundering regulations. But the trustees ongoing have the responsibility of keeping the TRS updated with change of addresses, change of circumstances of the trust, whether it's been um, updated, whether it's been shut down or anything along those lines. With regards to just general obligations, it's it's what you think it would be, annual trustee meetings. Mm. Whenever a decision needs to be made about the trust fund, so if it's a buy-to-let property, you know, are we going to kick the tenants out? Are we going to sell it? Are we going to do this? All needs to go through the trustees. And those meetings should be ideally recorded. Nowadays, Zoom um, electronically is fine, but if not, traditionally produce a set of minutes and signed. Um, so when any important decisions are made or just wrapping up the year of the trust, if there are money with money going into the trust income, the trust may have to do annual tax returns. Now, that is normally the job of the accountant. Not many trustees will be aware that they have that, they will have the, the, the ability to do those annual returns. But the trustees have these uh, fiduciary redu- uh, duties and responsibilities that are now embodied in the Trustee Act of 2000, where bring in all the professionals. If mm. you're a lay person who's been saddled with the responsibility of being a trustee, bring the accountant in, bring the lawyer in. Mm. Um, the biggest one that I will see is where there's uh, money going into a trust, say rental income going into a trust, and it's just accumulating as 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 cash, as capital. Well, Trustee Act 2000 says that the trustees have a responsibility to grow the trust fund, and they have to maintain a balance between capital preservation and growth. So yes, okay, deposit rates, you know, you can still get a good 4%, say at Chase Bank, but you can get 9 10% with a careful investment and a good IFA or a good financial advisor will know how to set up a suitable and uh, trustee investment vehicle. Mm. So the ongoing responsibilities more for trustees are to make sure, again, they bring in the right professionals to help them manage the trust. But I would say ongoing at least an annual meeting and keeping the TRS updated. Great. Um, Should we talk about the corporate side of things mm. and corporate structure because i think again that's important to to touch to touch upon as well um so yeah what what how's it how's it different to to normal sort of structure well i think a lot of people we've seen certainly in our business um the number of people coming to us over the last four years who mm. are landlords with one property right through to our our newest client he's got 435 properties um they are concerned that they haven't got their portfolio in the right structure mm. i think the the ignition for this was the loss of section 24 mortgage interest relief yeah, yeah you know obviously they get the basic tax credit now and someone quite rightly said to them do you know what if you can whack your com- your properties into a company and then change the company mortgage or change them into company mortgages you will get mortgage interest offset against corporation tax. Yeah, certainly something that we've heard a lot of yeah. recently um, with more yeah landlords trying to set up that structure to potentially uh, benefit from from tax. From, from more better tax yeah. relief. Um, so that's absolutely great. There's no problem with that. But from with a tax advisor hat on, the problem with going directly from private ownership into a company is there's a stamp duty charge of 5%. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. if you've got a million pound portfolio, 50 grand before you even start in stamp duty just to get into a company. What the bit that people are a bit woolly on and even accountants are a bit woolly on is how we can go into a company without paying the stamp duty. And this, again, 
unnecessarily so is quite contentious. But mm. fundamentally, if you incorporate a partnership, then you don't pay the stamp duty. And it's in the Finance Act, it's in the partnership legislation. But some people say you've got to have that partnership for a year. Some people say you've got to have it for three years. Mm. The answer is, as I teach everyone when I teach law, is the answer is it depends. It's your get out of jail free <laughs> as a professional advisor. When someone asks you a question, the answer is it depends. And it depends on how the partnership was set up. Without going into massive amounts of detail, if the partnership was set up in a way where um, the the properties were transferred into the partnership for a debt versus they were actually purchased by the partnership, that's the difference between the partnership having to be in existence for a year or three years. Okay, Safely, three years. But most people, if they've set up the partnership correctly, will go for a year. And then as long as it's not an artificial step that you're just forming the LLP for the purposes of incorporation, you can incorporate without paying the stamp duty. Now, it needs to be registered with Companies House, which is why we do LLPs. It needs to be registered with HMRC. You need to file partnership tax returns. But if you do that initial step properly, and you should be in a position at some point in the future to incorporate that LLP without paying the stamp duty. Now, with the capital gains tax, there's a two-prong issue. How did he know I was going to ask that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, was it the fact that you're, the holding, up a, question, the, yeah, that, you're, you're, you're holding up a whiteboard with CGT <laughs> yeah. on it? Although that, that's been debunked if anyone's watching this, of course. Um, but it's, I think, suppose it's because the next question that everyone asks. Yes. Um, there is incorporation relief, Section 162, Taxation of Chargeable Gains Act 1992. You have to get... To get incorporation relief, you have to have a significant business. Okay, Case law suggests, and this is set out in case law, a minimum of four properties, gross rent of 25 grand a year or more, that you're actively participating in the management of the portfolio. Now, obviously, letting agents to source and vet tenants is fine. Obviously, unless you're a sparky or a chippy, you're not going to do the manual work yourself. But who's making the phone calls? Who's dealing with the letting agent? And... Again, the bit that's very contentious is people say it's got to be 20 hours a week. Yeah. The point about that was that was comes out of the IRC and Ramsey case, which is where Mrs. Ramsey was looking for furnished holiday lets to qualify for business relief. That was just something that a judge said at that point, and that's something that people have held on to. But, of course, a lot of people who own student lets, mm. they don't do 20 hours a week. You know, one no. of my um, clients who's, who's got a number of student properties says, we do nothing for nine months of the year, then we go hell for leather for three months yeah. in the summer. Mm. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. It's more about what you do when it's required and maybe do you have a full-time job outside of that versus, um, you know, what you what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we speak to clients, for example, we actually get them to fill out a questionnaire of what they do to manage the portfolio. And if they happen to do all of that and they've got no other income, no other job, and they happen to do all of that in three months of the summer, that's not going to be a problem. So it has to be a significant business. And what's, I think, interesting about that is it favours the bigger landlords. So if you're a landlord who's got 20 buy-to-let properties yeah. and they're only worth 100 grand each versus a landlord, as I've got in London, who's only got two buy-to-lets and they're worth a million and a half each, yeah, doesn't matter. You know, mm. matey who's got the small... Uh, value properties is going to get more likely to get the incorporation relief so you've got the incorporation relief on one side then you've got this thing that seems to absolutely confuse everyone so i'm going to see if i can confuse you two chaps Easily what we've done yeah <laughs> what, <laughs> well, i can see you're getting ready for this oh, so, so <laughs> it's the what we call the equity versus gains ratio okay so equity is current value less mortgages mm -hmm. okay gains current value less purchase price less capital expenditure yeah equity has got to be greater than gains because the equity in your portfolio rolls over because it's rollover relief mm. into the shares in the limited company and that swallows up the capital gains so if i've got equity of a million and capital gains of eight hundred thousand, i've got two hundred thousand positive basically share capital mm -hmm. so i'm not going to pay any capital gains tax if it was the other way around so i've got a million pounds worth of gains and 800 grand's worth of equity i could do one of two things or well, three things actually. Number one, if I've got a property that is massively steeped in mortgages, so high loan to value and high gains, I could just leave that out of the planning. Okay. The other thing I could do is I could, um, I'm trying to think what the best, well, the most common option I should say is pay the capital gains tax. Wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Best option, that 200,000, thinking of a case study that I've got at the moment, 
they had a prudential investment that was maturing 220 grand. That was the shortfall. They just put that into the partnership prior to incorporation. So they made up that equitable loss with cash, a bit like a director's right. cash injection. So if the gains are greater than the equity, all we've got to do is either pay some tax, drop a property, or put a cash injection into the partnership pre-incorporation. But that's how you do it without stamp duty and then without triggering any capital gains. Now, again, what do we do about mortgages? My personal advice is go to the mortgage lender, and if you're not remortgaging at the time of incorporation, just seek their comfort that by transferring the beneficial interest into the company only, but keeping the legal ownership with the client privately, um, make sure they're not going to have a problem with that. Mm. The, the the lenders that we know of which I'm not going to name because they can always change their mind but we've got a good list and a bad list 80% of them especially the big lenders they don't even bother answering the client when they say can we have permission to do this which you have to take right. as a positive because <laughs> you're talking about the be the, the beneficial interest yeah, yeah you know they've got their security the legal ownership stays with the client they've got their charge over the property that's fine what we absolutely recommend is when that fixed deal comes to an end definitely look not to upset the lender anymore and look to remortgage in the name of the company. And why wouldn't you when you can offset the mortgage interest against yeah. mm. corp tax? So it shouldn't um, cause issues with the, with, the, with the lender. Just nipping back to the LLP stage, LLPs are tax transparent. So going from private ownership into an LLP is not a disposal for CGT. It's, there's no stamp duty and you're not disturbing the legal titles. So again, no issue with the lender. Okay, so that's how you would get into the company. Now, of course, the next problem is inheritance tax mm. because property companies don't qualify for business relief because they're deemed as an investment and not a trade. So what we do is look at creating uh, what we call freezer shares and growth shares. Now, freezer shares hold all the dividend and voting rights and basically are the current value of the properties uh, frozen. And the growth shares are, unsurprisingly, all of the increase in value of the properties from the date of incorporation to the date of death. And those growth shares go into trust. Our old friend comes back again, mm -hmm. the trust, for the benefit of the children. Okay, So from day one, if I incorporate my portfolio at 2 mil, and by the time of death it's 3.5 million, that 1.5 million growth is outside of my estate from day one. That's already with the children. Because it's already in the shares that are in trust for the children. Mm. With that two million value that I've I've just given as a hypothetical example, it's always worth knowing as well that when you incorporate, all the historic capital gains get wiped out. So if I then sold a property within the company, you would only pay tax on the increase in value of the property since you incorporated, which is huge. Right. Yeah. Again, what HMRC don't want you to do is just incorporate, let's say, six properties, wipe out all the gains, and then sell them mm. a month later and pay zero corporation tax. That's abuse. Mm -hmm. But if you were to start selling the properties over the course of two or three years and then paying reduced amounts of corporation tax, that's not a problem. But you, it is great that you can rebase those values when you incorporate because this is a big problem people have got. They've got uh, historic portfolios that are, that are massively pregnant with gains and they don't know what to do with them. Yeah, yeah. when the corporation tax, as a personal um, level, when, when corporation tax had the £12,000 allowance, if you made a hundred thousand pound on a property, once you'd knocked off all of the, all of the costs, all the capex, and this, that, yeah, and it really, you kind of pay the 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 um, capital gains tax bill with a bit of a smile on your face because mm. you thought it was going to be and twenty eight percent relief. Well, exactly, yeah, you thought it was going to be this, you know, twenty five thousand pound bill, and you're kind of like, well, actually, it's mm. just it's only a little bit of money, and I've made all of this, so but I'm all right with that, yeah. Three thousand difficult pound starting from a three thousand pound base though yeah. exactly so you can that so that so we can restructure that in terms of the shares and then two things you can do so if I've then got shares worth two million pounds in my hypothetical example I can either put that in I could either have created a director's loan at the time of incorporation for two million and I can actually do a deed of gift of that um, director's loan effectively assigning the benefit of that out for my children. So yes, I can't draw two million out of the company tax-free. You can't have your cake and eat it. So you can't <laughs> draw that all out and still benefit from the IHT relief. But most people will assign the benefit of that director's loan to their children. And that's a seven-year gift, a potentially exempt transfer, just like all gifts. So yeah. that's dealt with the two million current value. The growth shares are already outside of my estate. So that's how you make a property company tax efficient. Some people call them family investment companies. 
they're not quite the same, but it, it is near enough for the purposes of this conversation. And I still retain the dividend and voting right share so I can carry on receiving my, 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 my salary, my divvies, mm-hmm. my rental income through salary and dividends. The other thing that you can do, because often we, we get clients who've got property companies already, um, and they, we don't know whether a director's loan was set up at the time of incorporation. So what you can actually do is you can rewrite the company's mems and arts so that every time they pay a dividend, that actually reduces the value of the freezer shares. So loosely speaking, if I had two million pounds worth of freezer shares and I paid a, a 60 grand dividend, that would reduce the freezer shares by 60 grand every year from two million. Um, not as effective as having a two million director's loan and gifting the entire uh, amount away in seven years. No, because it slowly burns it away. It slowly it? burns it away. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's, it's dispelling this myth that, you know, you can't retain any... I mean, it's hard in an LLP if you try and do it with an LLP. So people who haven't got four or five properties, they're stuck in the LLP phase. So we can create capital interest and growth interest, which are the same idea as freezer and growth shares. But with the with the capital interest we can't write that as a, as a as a partner's loan and then gift that away because they need they want the rental income and that is a gift of reservation of benefit within the llp so if people want to undertake that same planning within an llp they've got to forego the rental income mm. a bit like our old friend the trust earlier so you know we have got this issue that if they stay in the llp phase they're probably going to have to deal with that original value of the properties um, that it was going to be in their estate and just deal with the growth. But if they can get into a company, it really is, you know, you can pay your salary, you can pay your divvies, you can retain control of your company, you can deal with the growth in value, and you can deal with the current value. And you can offset mortgage interest against corporation tax when you port the mortgages over. Nice. So all I would say is, again, it's it's going over all ground, but I think it's really important, is when I speak to clients about this and they say, my, my accountant hasn't told me about this. Don't be harsh on the accountant. The accountant's mm. just been running your books. They've done your tax returns. Yeah. Um, don't be harsh and say, well, my conveyancing solicitor hasn't told me about this. You know, this is a combination of trusts, corporate, and tax. So my team that work on this, for example, there's six people that work on every individual case. There's commercial solicitors that work on the LLP agreements and the business asset transfer agreements and the initial minutes for the LLPs. And there are two chartered tax advisors, each bringing their own sub areas of expertise into the advice just on forming an LLP. And there's me as the trust lawyer. So this isn't something that one individual can do. Mm. And again, it's this, it's an accountant shouldn't feel like you're treading on their toes because most people that do this and advise on this, certainly in my side of the field, aren't interested in doing the accountancy just as much as the accountants aren't interested in doing the tax and legal advice so if you've got those professionals that can work together as a good team Mm. the lawyers and the the tax advisors advise the lawyers set up and the accountants run the business and everyone from a business perspective gets to 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 earn a, a decent fee for what they've done and i don't see any problem with that so we don't expect anyone listening or watching to retain all of that because I certainly haven't. Yeah, I think how's, your, how's your brain? It's spinning. <laughs> um, Mine's just absorbed knowledge. My, my opinion on these things is is to grab on to 5 or 10% or really listen hard to something where it resonates or is 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 kind of within your mm. your your place. And it, but it does show exactly what can be done and where it can be done at different points of an investment journey, which is so fascinating because there's five or six things that I had absolutely no idea about, particularly around the capital gains, particularly around um, the the shares of, of how you can slowly burn away the, the value of that if you want to. So you're effectively in control of your property portfolio, but it's not in inverted commas, your property portfolio anymore. Mm. You're, you don't have that asset or you don't have that um issue on because it's already it's like running a company that you that you own or running a company that you are just that is is owned for you yeah in in a sense for for want of a more layman term of no, of, of, right. of of kind of describing it which is absolutely fascinating particularly for those landlords as you say who are going past four or five properties it's probably too much cost and too much hassle for those landlords who have got less than that, I would guess. I think, 
on a normal no, value. I, no, I, I totally agree. I think I think if I, and this is what I advise, I think it's very hard because without wishing to say make this political because it's not all socio-economic, these are hard times, right? Mm. No one wants to spend money that they don't have to spend. But whether it's from your accountant, whether it's from your tax advisor, whether it's from your estate planner, whether it's from your financial advisor, your lawyer, whoever, before acting... Get some advice. Yeah, mm. you know, I I had a guy. We're working with him at the moment. We are at the LLP phase. He will incorporate because he's got ten properties, three million quid's worth. But he rung me up yesterday. He said, "Paul, I'm thinking of doing this." And he basically he was going to pay down the mortgages because he's you know like we all do have half mm. a million pounds mm. floating around. So he yeah, wants yes. mortgages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he said, "I just want." I said, "I said well, I'll give his name then." But I I said, "Mark." I said. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's not. Um, I said, Mark, I said, look, you you know, paying down the mortgages makes no difference because you've, he, I think it was three million with, with half a million quid worth of mortgages. His equity gains ratio was fine. Mm. I said, look, it makes no difference, but I really appreciate the fact that you've rung up and you've asked me before you've done something yeah. mm. rather than say, hey, Paul, I've done this. And this Here's is what I, I did. Don't, I don't yeah, want yeah, you to yeah. screw it up. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of people as well, and I will mention this because this is something that I think mm. people will be will be will be have their mind on less tax for landlords. Okay, mm, yeah. hugely contentious. The whole concept of hybrid LLPs. Now, everyone's going to have a different take on it, and to their credit, less tax for landlords have said we've done nothing wrong. It wasn't HMRC disapproved. We're trying to help people who are undergoing investigations or whatever. Just be careful about the advice you take. Genuinely, if something seems too good to be true, it yeah. probably is. Now, just because your circumstances fit statutory provisions, accepted statutory provisions that allow you to do something, don't think it's too good to be true. So if someone says, well, I think, you know, you do qualify for incorporation relief. You know, you this isn't deliberate deprivation if you put granny's home in a trust. Don't necessarily think, hmm, this is too good to be true. But... For example, the whole concept of hybrid LLPs were pretty much untested. So when Spotlight 63 came out, and now you know thousands of landlords are now having to undo hybrid LLPs, and we are undoing two or three mm. of them for clients, it's just it, it's just get that advice. Yeah, um, it's going to cost. No one gives anything away for free. You mm. know, you might just uh, an advisor may give you just two or three bits of information, um, but it's going to be very generic. And even we in our business, we will. Someone will present their portfolio, and they say, "Is there anything that can be done?" And we say, "Yes, there is." And they go, "What?" I say, "Well, we can get you into a company, but we don't give them what one of my colleagues calls the keys to the sweet shop, because it's, you know, if you think about our tax advisors and lawyers, 150, 200 years of experience, mm. Mm. and professionals don't give that away for free. So get that advice, you know, do I, but the question, do I, do I, if I'm going to start off buying my first property, do I buy it in a company or do I buy it in private ownership? That isn't just a question of yes or no, because they would examine your personal financial yeah. circumstances. Yeah. Are you going to grow the portfolio? Yeah. So get that advice before you act. That's all I can, I can, I would strongly recommend. And for those that are already on their journey, if they've only got two or three properties and they're not looking at necessarily going down five, six, seven properties, there is stuff that we can do in the LLP phase and there is the trust stuff that we discussed mm. earlier, all of which have their limitations. But have the conversation. You know, speak to your, your estate planner who's got a knowledge of trust. Speak to your accountant. Um, speak to any professional who's got that bit of insight that they can give you and then just make a, um, a reasoned and rational choice weighing up the information and the pros and cons because there are always pros and cons. Even if the con is, it's going to cost you a few thousand pounds in legal advice and implementation. But... There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Yeah, I mean, I've always been of the opinion that if I'm paying a slightly lower rate of tax than the standard income tax, then paying tax is no bad thing because it means I've made some money and paying a lower rate of tax than the standard income tax means someone has done something slightly more intelligent than mm. the absolute minimum. So I'm on, I'm on the right road because, look, we've all got to pay tax. Anyone who pays no tax should be seriously looked at, um, well, they say whether morally or financially. Abs abs <laughs> I absolutely agree. And my 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 mantra, and it's actually up in 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 you know in my mind virtually. I ought to put it on my office wall. But it's something someone taught me years ago: is the tax tail shouldn't wag the dog's head. Mm. 
You know, if you're thinking about putting a property, a group of properties into a company, it shouldn't be for tax. You know, is it going to be more flexible? Is it going to give me mortgage interest relief? Is it going to give me more flexibility over dividend and, and salary payments? Can I bring my kids in to make it a family company? Or we can make 60 grand a year employer pension contributions to reduce, you know, yeah, okay, reduce the tax. But mm. there's lots of other reasons why you should be going into the company. If it's all about tax, 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 you're going to come unstuck. Yeah. Going back to the trust idea, if you solely want to put an asset into trust to avoid care fees, you're of the right, wrong mindset. And I will actually not take instructions from a client who is of that fixed mindset. You've got to understand, like you say, divorce, second children, children living abroad, all that sort of thing. And then that also, when people say, gosh, why is it costing me 1,500 quid, not 500 pounds? It's because it does so much more than you think it does. Yeah. So yeah, do, never, although every, no one wants to pay tax, you know, I totally take your point. And if you can finish the process better off from a tax perspective mm. than where you started, and like you hinted earlier on about saying, okay, it may have cost me six grand, but I've saved 400 grand, mm. then you know you've done the right thing. Yes, yeah, it's a good mm. return on investment. It's a good return. <laughs> and if you can put your head on the pillow at night, yeah, because you've no, no one's going to come chasing regulated yeah, professionals yeah, who've yeah. got the right professional indemnity insurance and the right moral, is interesting mm. point, the right moral viewpoint. Because I know some advisors who are like, I will do everything so you pay no, no, not a penny yeah. of tax. And they might do it legitimately. But I feel like that's ambulance chasing and loophole absolutely. gaining and all that kind of thing 100%. where at some point you're going to get tripped up or it's going to get, get closed. Yeah. We, yeah. we have to say all the time to people, they say, oh gosh, but I'm still going to pay a little, you know, gosh, I'm still going to have to pay X amount dividend tax on my income. Yeah, sorry. Mm. But what if I put this into a queue up and shove it offshore? Sorry, I'm not touching it. Yeah. Pay a bit of tax. Reduce if you, like I said, mm. if you're better off than where you started, yeah. be happy with that. Yeah, yeah. Paul, it's been amazing having you on this this show. My brain is absolutely <laughs> destroyed uh, with all of the knowledge bombs you've been dropping in. Um, so yeah, look, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure our listeners have have learned learned a lot as well. If you are listening. Paul's details will be in the show notes. If so you made it to the end, drop a comment. If you made it to the end, if you made it, we'll send you a, 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 a winner's medal. Yeah, a finish, a finish yeah, get a certificate. Get a certificate. <laughs> but yeah, his details will be in the in the show notes. So if you want to find out more information or you need that expert advice, then please get in contact with Paul. Um, if you are listening as well and you like this episode, make sure that you hit the subscribe button, the like button, put the comments in as well. Helps with the algorithms, helps with this property being being shown to, to more people as well that need to know this, this information. So until next time, thank you, Paul, thank for, you, for coming on. Mike, thank you as always. Pleasure. See you next week.